How do you there guys and welcome back to Edgar TV and if you're new around here just quickly introduce myself my name is Matthew Edgar PDC professional dart player and sports coach slash teacher for the last 10 sort of years with that qualifications in sports science sports psychology NGBs such as like you know football sport specific sort of things as well so um, and one of the questions I wanted to touch on today was one thing we come across quite regular does playing better players make you a better player will that improve your game and that's sort of the topic of what we're going to do today now first of all I'm going to load this with information it's going to be some as a personal sort of experience and spin as a player and a lot of it's going to be facts data and actual proven science and how the body works and the brain etc etc sports psychology all sorts of bits make sure you can find yourself somewhere quiet where you can just sit and listen to this information because it might change your mind or it might just confirm what you already think so it's a good bit really just to challenge ourselves and challenge what we think either to to further confirm what we think or just to make us go hmm, maybe i have a little look at that myself so find yourself somewhere quiet to do that. the other thing i've done is i've not put any mid ads in this I've, I've contacted youtube and i've put no mid ads so it'll just be smooth all the way through so please do if you do like this video guys hit the thumbs up button just underneath here and also try not to avoid hitting that little skip 15 bit because you might miss a very important part it's also worth noting that if you do enjoy this video and you think you know what this guy might be able to help me i do offer darts personal training sessions and you can catch me on this facebook page you'll see here or on darts mad i'll put a link in the description below you can go over to the facebook or the darts mad you'll see lots of different reviews and different things where people who have worked with before i've sort of put different opinions on there um, about how the sessions went so check those out and have a read see if you think it'd be beneficial to you Get in contact if you think you'd like a session yourself. The first thing to look at is cognitive bias. Now, cognitive bias is basically where we are able to form opinions with limited amounts of information, fed information, lack of information, or our perception of what things are. That's a very quick summary of what a cognitive bias is. This could be something like, oh, I'm getting to doubles against this player, and this player is so much better than me, or oh, I'm winning legs. Where we're setting ourselves up for failure, but we're ex we're able to sort of like find the joys within that. Like, oh, I can get legs off this guy. Um, now, cognitive bias. This is something, like I say, where we can get a very limited amount of information and form an opinion. Such as, Phil Taylor comes on TV and Phil Taylor goes, I practice eight hours a day. And then we all think, right, well, to be Phil Taylor, I need to practice eight hours a day. But obviously we're all built differently and we're all different ways. Who's to say Phil Taylor's even doing eight hours a day? But because we hear that and we've got that little bit of information, we make that opinion and that assumption that that's the way to go. This is also something that comes up in sales a lot of the time, cognitive bias. For example, if you come into my shop and you see this piece of paper, and I say, this piece of paper, you've got no knowledge about paper, and I say, you can buy this piece of paper for 10 pence. You'll look at that and go, okay, logged it, 10 pence. If I then go, or... Special offer, you can have twice as much paper on the same sheet. These are five pence. You'll go, right, so it's ten pence for that price. It's five pence for that. So I've set that. I, I gave you that sort of predetermined outcome that that's the going rate. That's 10p. This piece could be three pence a piece. But because I've predetermined with you, you can get a smaller piece for 10p. You can get a bigger piece for 5p. It leads you in. Car sales, uh, house sales, lead very much on cognitive bias. Show you a car that you probably won't like and put the price like, oh, here's a £9,000 car. You say, I want a car like this. You go, here's one that's £9,000. Or you can have this one, and this one sort of hits your specifications a bit more. This one gets your juices flowing. This one's 8000 And you go, ooh. So the, the market price says that the car I don't really want is 9000 but the one I do want is eight. So it leads you into doing that. It's the same thing with this. Cognitive bias. We can pick things up. We can go, I'm throwing better averages. Well, of course you're throwing better averages because you're not having darts at doubles no more. So it means we're throwing on the scores. The other thing that this could do is if we flip cognitive bias and we look at the negative effects of performance, then let's say, for example, I'm playing Zach Thornton. Thornton darts. Sorry, Zach. Sorry. Um, if I go and practice with Zach now... The thing is that the ability levels of me and Zach are extremely different. So if we're playing and the theory works in central, Zach should be getting better all the time. 
However, what's going to actually happen is if we play first to six, first to ten, most of the time he's not going to get to a double because the difference in ability range. Now, what that's going to do is that's going to take his level of board mastery that he's throwing. He's no longer going to be throwing at various trebles, doubles, singles, applying different levels of force on a vertical and horizontal line, basically. What he's actually going to be doing now is he's going to be using an isolator training drill in the fact that now all he's going to be doing is throwing at treble 20 or switching to the 19s, maybe the 18s. That is going to be his game. That is all he's going to do. So he's going to be doing the isolated practice. So again, a little bit of a negative in terms of the actual practice of it, but key to remember, cognitive bias. You will perceive it to be better than it is based on your predetermined outcomes that you expect to get from that practice. Now, in different sports and different situations, we have different factors that can become playable here. With darts, we're talking mostly psychological. There's no physical benefits. Take Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, for example. When I used to go to a BJJ session, and they used to go, right, we're going to partner up, we're going to do some rolling, or we're going to do some drills. The first thing I'd want to do is I'd want to get with one of the highest graded. Is there a black belt in here? You know, that's the first thing. Right, who's next? Who's next? And I'd try and get with those sort of people. The reason being is because such as a simple arm bar, there is 20, 30, 40, and so many different ways in which you can get into, which a higher grade of belt will know that access to. Especially when you're rolling with them. Sometimes they might lead you onto something, and they'll go, you could have got that, and then they'll stop and they'll go, right, if you did this and this, you could have got into that position. You go, right, cool, logged it. I've got a benefit of that. Same on a the defence. They might get into something and they say, right, you should have done X, Y or Z. And it had got you around that situation. So there's things in which we can do with learning with that. Now, if you think about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, for example, you could finish this YouTube video and go on and learn how to do an armbar. It's not the learning of the move, it's learning of how to set up to the move. That is the important factor in terms of that. With darts, we kind of don't have that. We can take an element of learning in terms of the player and how they sort of set up shots or the routes that they go, but we can kind of get that learning just from watching darts on the TV. There's no real benefit of playing against somebody, and again, then that takes you out of your sort of own concentration levels within your practice so then you're sort of like seeing what routes they're going and things so again then we lose that psychological edges in the um the, the practice and the concentration so in terms of the actual physical side i'll say yeah there's many sports many sports in which playing with or working with better people will have a massive impact to performance but i'm still not convinced darts is one of them let's dig a little bit deeper so arousal levels in sport, this is your mental and physical engagement with the task. Now you'll see here the optimum level of arousal. Now what we've got down the side here is our level of performance. Weak level of performance to a strong level of performance. Along the bottom here we've got a low level of arousal up to a high level of arousal. Like I said, these are a psychological state in which we perform. The ideal level of performance, the optimal level of performance to get the strong level of performance is right in the middle. So we're engaged, we're concentrating, we're focused, but we don't have an overactivity in the frontal lobe. So what we've got here is, let's say, the engagement. A low level of engagement this is the total opposite of what we're talking about. This is playing and practicing with people you know you're going to beat, where it doesn't really matter about the outcome. You're just throwing darts, either in you know a bit of a, a, a light practice routine, or you're playing someone in a practice game down your local, and you're just having a bit of a mess around sort of thing. With that, the level of performance in which we can reach is limited. So this line here, this curvy line, this is our level of performance. Now, if we go here and we, we mix across, you might recognise this, you know, if you're just having to mess around down the pub with your mates and things, you can never really hit that peak level of performance where you play your absolute best. However, if we look at the line of performance and we move it across, it is exactly the same in terms of the level of performance in relation to our arousal in the fact that this time now we're over aroused. This happens when you play people that are too difficult, when the situation's too precision, when the perception of the task is too hard, we then have a dip in performance. So we still don't reach the optimal level of performance. So with this, we're sort of in that panic. This is where we get the stress. This is where we've got the overactivity of the lobe. And this is where then we'll start getting different 
uh, chemical reactions, uh, frustrations, uh, body reacting in different ways, but not in a way that is actually going to push us forward. This is where we push, it's where we lift, we lift up the middle like building a tent. How tall can we make that tent? So we're looking at extending that middle bit, to, but when we work in here, we're not really pushing that up. We, we're more, if you look at it, it's like a slide, isn't it? It's more like a slippery slope, like a slide. So we need to get ourselves in this middle level. Playing a player who is out of your ability range will not benefit in terms of lifting your peak level of performance. The teachers of the world out there in the Edgar Nation will recognize this. Comfort, stretch and panic. This is basically how you need to look at your students when you're delivering a lesson to make sure that you are developing those. If you look, there is a very small yellow line in the middle, which is the stretch zone. This is a very hard zone to get into, but this is where we make those develops. We grow the optimal level of performance that we talked about and we try and lift that level of performance higher through the middle ground. That's your stretch zone. You'll see in the middle, comfort zone. This was the bottom end of that low arousal state. It's easy. You are unchallenged, bored. The brain is not engaged with the task. You are just turning over a technique. This is where then you start to perform more sloppy type techniques, where then you start to produce issues within your technique, which then will heighten with poor practice. We've got a panic zone. The panic zone is completely the opposite end. That is the big red thing around the outside. This is where then the practice is too hard, when the challenge is too hard. Look at some of the buzzwords that they have used in this reflection for your lessons. Frustrated. If you're getting beat 10 nil, 15 nil, 15 one, restricted to a couple of darts at a double and forced into an isolated practice, you're going to start getting frustrated, fed up, exhausted. Tense. Tense is a good one. Stressed. Fearful. And these are all things that we can look at soon because when these start coming, we need a boost and we need a lift, which I'll get to in a second. So I would say when the challenge is too hard and you're playing someone above your ability range, you will go into that panic zone. That stretch zone is where we need to be. Look at those. Willingness to take risks. Excited. Aroused, excited, arousal levels, alive, expectant, challenged. That is where you need to be. Look at those words and in terms of what that can do to your level of performance. To get in this zone, yes, the practice partner is important. It is vital. You don't want to practice with someone that is too easy. You don't want to practice with someone that's too hard. You want to practice with someone around your ability range with a purpose. By that, I mean we're not just going along having 10, 15 minutes, then we'll play the fruit machine, then we'll play a game of pool, then we might jump back on darts. Me and Kevin Painter, when we meet up, we have a chat at the start, we have a chat at the end, we might have a chat if we have a break in the middle, but when we're playing, we're playing darts. We're not talking to each other, we're not going over things, we're not talking about the football match, we're not watching the telly. It's a proper practice session, it gets us in that stretch zone. That's where we need to be, you need to get yourself a practice partner who is going to to challenge and push the boundaries, that's the stretch zone. If they're not pushing your boundaries, you're comfortable. Pushing the boundaries, just keeping you in that stretch zone. You should never really feel fully achieved within that stretch zone because it should, as soon as you get there, as soon as you get to where you want to be, it moves again and it moves again, it moves again. So it's always stretching. Stretching because we're learning. Stretching because we're raising the optimal level of performance. Stretch zone is very, very important. So the frontal lobe, this is basically you. It's broken down into lots and lots of different sections, but we'll keep it simple. We'll just go over the functions. So the first thing is how it makes you. It makes you emotionally, how you control and regulate your emotions, but also how you recognize that in other people. Motor functions, voluntary motor functions, such as me moving my arms around or going for a walk or going to do things, which is vital when we're playing a sport. Frontal lobe, because I'm... Um, Voluntary throwing my arm, trying to throw it into a direction. I'm walking to the board, I'm walking back, etc, etc. Impulsiveness, problem solving, and obviously social interactions. Very important if we, that's how we recognise emotions in other people. Now, damage to this area can cause, this is where you get things such as ADHD. When we've got damage to the frontal lobe, because you've got that lack of concentration, you've got that sort of impulsive nature, that sort of, that voice in your head that says this isn't a good idea, such as um, 
When Mensa Suljevic beat me in the second round of the World Championship this year, I wanted to punch him in the face. However, that little bit in the frontal lobe goes, this ain't a good idea, because there's these consequences that go with that. If you have a damage in that area, when you go, I want to punch him in the face, you don't get that little voice that goes, oh, hang on a minute, this ain't a good idea, let's not do this. That's not there. It doesn't register. So what happens is I come up and I have a full swing and lamp one and then get banned from sports for the rest of my life. But I'll get lots of views on YouTube from that clip, I suppose, won't I? But, you know, um, that's like the conflict and things that go on. Now, when we've got an overactivity and this part of the brain is over engaged or overactive and it cannot cope because of... The perception of the task, the stresses that we put on and sort of that anxiety that we're building up within. We need a boost. We need a backup. Uh, norepinephrine, adrenaline, things like this. Chemistries, uh, chemicals within the brain will be released to the body. Now, if we look at the things that they're going to do, such as the anxiety side, the heart rate will change. Um, adrenaline opens up the air passages, increases uh, the blood pressures, increases the the heart rates, increases the, the eyes, the pupils will grow. We're going to have a change in our blood glucose. All these things are basically to set us up to do something about it right now. We're going to fight or we're going to run away really fast. Not an ideal situation to be in because then we're going into that over arousal level. Now, I know what some of you are probably thinking. You're probably thinking I might not get to that state because if I get to that state, what's happening I'm only practicing, so I'm not going to get myself that wound up. It's not going to happen because it's only practice and I'm just seeing how I get on. Well, then we've got a conflict because the the brain or the body and, the, you know, we're, we're then if we've got that conflict, what we're then trying to do is we're trying to set ourselves up for failure because we're not getting to that sort of optimal level of arousal. We're not allowing ourselves to get to optimal level of arousal because we go... Even if I get to that, or even if I do everything and push myself to that peak level of performance, it's not good enough because of the perception of the task. So there's a conflict there in terms of the, the interaction with that frontal lobe, ultimately hindering your long-term development. So again, that's where we need to make sure that the challenge we present in ourselves is within that stretch zone so that we don't have a conflict because we've got that conflict and if we're talking it down all we're going to do is slip straight back into that comfort zone where actually me getting walloped i'm bored of this now you know i'm just i'm just getting walloped what's the point we go completely the opposite end it's very hard to get in that middle zone but that's what we're trying to get so what do you think did it change your mind did it make you think a little bit more was you one of the people that thought, by playing better players, I'm going to be better? And now it's made you think differently. Or do you just still think the same? That's absolutely fine. You know, um, was you one of the people that thought, like I do, it's not going to make you better playing better people, but now you know a bit of facts and a bit of science and a bit of data behind it, and anytime anyone challenges you, you can go, go check out Edgar TV and watch this presentation on, does playing better people make you better based on the psychology and the brain? What do you think? Has it changed your mind? Has it changed your perception? Has it made you think a little bit more about it? Let me know in the comments section below. Yeah, like I said, guys, if you like this video, hit the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to Edgar TV. Join the Edgar Nation. I'm on my way to that 100,000 plaque. I really want to get 100,000 subscribers so I can get a plaque. That would be amazing. So help a guy out. Hit that subscribe button, guys. Share the video if you've liked it, if you found it useful and you think other people could find it useful as well. Hit that share button, put it on your social medias. And, guys, I'll catch you soon for some more Edgar TV.